Eileen, Eileen, how I love Eileen. Here at Larry's Leaning Pumpkins, we pride ourselves on our patented leaning pumpkins. Each and every fruit is crooked with care and lopsided with love through the elimination of all flying insects from our property. Since 2006, when we let Kids Bop 10 film a music video here and every child was stung by a yellow jacket on their juice break and every one of them was allergic, we've been committed to a safe pumpkin picking environment for our customers. We've got murder hornets covered. At Larry's Leaning Pumpkins, you'll find a limited selection of these highly coveted pumpkins. Why demand perfection when you can have Eileen? Any day I can wear my bright orange shirt, it's going to be a great day for a pumpkin field day. Hi everyone, my name is Jim Jasinski. I'm with Ohio State University, the Department of Extension, the IPM program. And we are currently at the Western Ag Research Station, which is located in South Charleston, Ohio. This is where we have for over 20 years had a pumpkin field day where folks, growers, come from around the state and in fact out of the state to come here to learn about production practices and IPM practices that apply to pumpkins. This year, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we can't have people come to the station and have our traditional field day. So we've decided to display and highlight our research and demonstration plots through a series of videos. We are going to have multiple speakers. We're going to have Tony Dobbles from the Department of Horticulture and Crop Science talk about a herbicide weed screen, including a new herbicide reflex. We'll have Celeste Welty from the Department of Entomology talk about those key early season cucurbit pests such as squash bugs, cucumber beetles, and squash vine borer. And then I'll chip in a few segments. I'll be talking about an update on our mustard cover crop biofumigation project, our powdery mildew fungicide demonstration trial, and our pumpkin and squash hybrid trial. Although you're going to get a lot of great information from these series of videos, I have to say there's also some great book resources that you want to be familiar with. Such as the 2020 Midwest Veg Production Guide, all the information about insects, diseases, and weeds in here. A couple of editions of the Compendium of Diseases for Cucurbits, great resource to show you all the diseases and great pictures. Also this great um, bulletin about identifying pests and cucurbits. Lots of great colorful pictures in here as well. And then this pumpkin production guide for all the basics about production. So if you have those at your side in these series of videos, I'm sure you're going to have a great season producing pumpkins. We start every one of our traditional field days with a wagon ride out to the field and this year is going to be no different. So let's go ahead and get the show on the road and start our 2020 virtual pumpkin field day. Welcome to the first stop of the pumpkin field day. Behind me here is the mustard cover crop biofumigation trial. The goal of the trial is to try to reduce the amount of plectosporium blight inoculum that's in the soil right now, which attacks pumpkins, it affects the fruit, it affects the foliage, it affects the vines. This disease, plectosporium, also known as microdochium or white speck, is on the rise here in Ohio. It thrives under cool, moist conditions and it attacks the foliage, the fruit, and the vines. It produces a very distinctive diamond-shaped lesion on all those plant parts. Those lesions can then coalesce into a much larger patch. Uh, it can turn the vines from green to almost bone white. If it gets on the handles and on the fruit, it can also bleach them, hence its nickname, white speck. We've had microdochium here at the research station for a couple of years. It pops up here and there. In the field behind me, we had a powdery mildew trial in 2018. In that trial, we saw pretty heavy amounts of plectosporium and decided to try to find a way to control for that. So one of the ideas that I had was instead of using um, fungicides, we would try this mustard cover crop biofumigation technique. The idea is that you plant a mustard cover crop, let it grow up to flowering stage where this compound in the tissue called glucosinolate peaks, 
you then uh, mow and incorporate that plant tissue into the soil, which gives a sort of a biofumigation effect. The idea was that it would lower the amount of plectosporium that's in the soil, therefore less would be available to attack the fruit. We had five treatments. One of them was an untreated check, so uh, no mustard cover crop and no fungicide. Three of the next treatments have cover crops, Caliente 199, Pacific Gold, and a combination of those two as a third treatment. And then the last treatment, there was no mustard cover crop, but we used compounds that I reported to suppress the disease. Those are the strobilurins, Flint, and Cabrio, Quadris, those kinds of products. Here's a quick summary of the 2019 trial. The mustard cover crop went in mid-April. It was terminated mid-June. We transplanted a solid gold pumpkins into the stand. We then took disease foliage ratings, and then we harvested and looked at ratings on the fruit and the pumpkin handles as well. Between the period of July 1st and mid-September, we had a little over three and a half inches of rain here, which means we're pretty much in a drought. As I mentioned to you, microdochium or plectosporium needs moisture to really begin to uh, become active. And so we saw very little impact on the foliage, the petioles, the leaves, and we saw very little evidence of uh, plectosporium on the fruit. None on the fruit itself, just a couple of handles with a couple of lesions, that's it. So due to the very dry, drought-like conditions, uh, we didn't see much development of that disease here uh, in 2019. So we decided to repeat the experiment in 2020, in this, in this spring. So we followed the same protocol. We went ahead, had the five treatments, the untreated check, the three that have cover crops, and the one that's only treated with uh, the strobilurin fungicide. That cover crop went into the ground mid-April, just like in 2019. It was terminated mid-June, just like 2019. And then we waited 10 days and direct seeded this time. We've taken a few sets of readings on the foliage, and right now we have a little bit higher damage than we had in 2019, but not very much. We're kind of averaging between three and 8%, uh, which is still not really enough to, uh, to see that disease uh, flourish and actually take down some plants. So if the cool, wet conditions persist, we should expect to see this microdochium or plectosporium population kind of build and maybe uh, show some results from the mustard cover crops. At the same time that we're trying to reduce the amount of plectosporium blight inoculum in the soil, we're also adding a little bit of organic matter to the soil, which is a good thing for soil health. And we're also making those flowering plants available to the pollinators in the area uh, the short period that we do have a bloom cycle. So in addition to the research trial behind me, we have one on-farm project going on in Cincinnati. There, they planted four strips of mustard cover crop uh, in between four strips of no mustard cover crop. So we're looking at the effect of the cover crop essentially to see if we can, uh, again, reduce that amount of plectosporium inoculum. At this site, we originally thought we had no microdochium. Then I received a picture of some damage on the plants and the grower asked me, what is this? I said, that's microdochium, that's plectosporium. And so uh, I've gone down there a couple times and looked at what's going on. And in the mustard strips and in the uh, untreated strips, we just have these really intense pockets where the plectosporium blight has taken over. At this point, uh, it's already blighted a lot of the tissue on the petioles, on the leaves. It's gotten onto the vines and actually gotten onto the fruit. And so it's something that is, uh, is actually a quite heavy population. I haven't seen something uh, quite that dramatic in a couple of years. But um, it appears as that the areas where the mustard cover crop was planted aren't much different than the areas where it was not planted. So at this point, the jury is still out. We still have another um, month or so to do the analysis to see if something turns around, that mustard cover crop uh, does stabilize the microdochium infection. Um, at this point, I'm just not sure. So later this fall, I'll have a report on both this research study behind me and the on-farm trial in Cincinnati to the effect of, do we see any differences with the mustard cover crop or no mustard cover crop with respect to the reduction of plectosporium blight or microdochium on pumpkin foliage or fruit. That pretty much wraps up the update I had for you for the mustard cover crop biofumigation project. And now we're gonna go ahead and visit Tony Dobbles and talk about some weed management. Here we are at the second stop of our pumpkin field day. Tony, go ahead and take it away. Good morning. Hello, I'm Tony Dobbles. 
with the uh, Department of Horticulture and Crop Science at The Ohio State University and I work in weed control with corn and soybean mostly but I'm out here with Jim Jasinski today to talk about some pumpkin weed control and a lot of the same herbicides that are used in corn and soybeans are also used in pumpkins and one of those is Reflex which has been predominantly used for soybeans and our trials today we've put some treatments of Reflex in on, on the on these pumpkins because it has recently received a 24c for pumpkins so we'd like to take a look at that today okay so we've got nine treatments here today that we're going to walk through and the way we do this with corn and soybeans is we'll have an untreated check that way we know what kind of weeds we're rating against and we rate everything against the untreated check so this trial got established on July 27th. The ground was tilled to remove any existing weeds and kind of reset the seed bank. The pumpkins were planted after that on the 27th and then our treatments were applied and then later that day we actually received almost three quarters of an inch of rain which is perfect activation for these pre-emergence herbicides because they need that rainfall activation to work because as the weed seedlings grow the herbicides are taken up through the shoots and the roots and that's how the weeds are controlled so we need that good rainfall activation but back to the untreated check here being a little bit late some weeds kind of stop germinating once it gets hot out and we don't have the same weed pressure that we would in the spring but as we walk through here, we can kind of see we've still got some grasses to rate. There's velvet leaf in here. And then we also have two different amaranth species. We have red root pigweed and water hemp. And water hemp is becoming quite a problem in Ohio because it's resistant to a lot of herbicides. So that's a good thing to consider when we walk through these plots too, is the different modes of action and what will and won't control the water hemp and then there's also some giant ragweed and morning glory in here so we'll be talking about those as we walk through the rest of the treatments <laughs> all right so treatment number two is sandia and that is a ALS inhibiting herbicide which was actually first used in corn it got registered it's actually been around for almost 30 years so uh, some of these products have had a pretty long le longevity, but um, one of the problems with the ALS inhibitors is that, that they have been around so much and have been used so much that there's a lot of ALS resistance. Uh, we hear a lot of talk about resistance in weeds, and we especially have that in corn and soybeans, but that's going to transfer to any other crop we have too. The weeds are still going to be resistant no matter what crop we have. So. Sandia pre-emergent is pretty good on the small seeded broadleaves, but it has no control of grass. So if this was applied in the spring, we'd probably this plot would probably be full of grass. But it was also good on the ragweed species also, common and giant ragweed when it first came out. However, on this farm here in South Charleston, Ohio, most of our ragweeds are ALS resistant. So we can see quite a few of the giant ragweed coming through these through this herbicide and my guess is that they would be ALS resistant and then a lot of the water hemp in the state is resistant to glyphosate and the ALS herbicides too so even though sandia is pretty good on small seeded broadleaves there's quite a bit of water hemp in this plot also so moving on to treatment number three this is dual tube magnum it's a group 15 chloroacetamide herbicide. They're basically known for controlling grasses and can have some activity on the small seeded broadleaf weeds. So um, with that rainfall that we had out here after these were applied, the, the dual is doing exactly what it should. We did see a few small grass seedlings in the untreated check and there are no grass seedlings in here. and dual is known for controlling pigweeds so we don't see any of the pigweeds in here either or the water hemp so 
it's really doing what it should. It's not going to control the larger seeded broadleaves like the morning glory or the giant ragweed. So we still see quite a bit of giant ragweed in this plot. So treatment number four is strategy. And that's probably the go-to herbicide program for pumpkin weed control right now. And what strategy actually is, is a premix of two different products. We have Command, which is Clomazone, which is one half of the premix. And it is known for grass control and velvet leaf control. However, its big weakness is pigweeds or the amaranth species. But then it's premixed with ethylfluralin, which in the soybean market is known as sonalan, one of the dinitroanilins. It's, they have been around for quite some time. And they're also good on grasses and should help out with the small seeded broadleaves. But it can be a little bit weak on pigweed too. So as we walk through this plot, we can see that it's controlled all the grasses very well. And if there was lamb's quarter in here, it'd be probably be doing a pretty good job on lamb's quarter. But then towards the front of the plot here, we can see a few little red root pigweeds coming through. So that's one of the problems with uh, the strategy is that it can be a little bit weak on the pigweeds. Then one other thing I wanted to note is that command can actually set back giant ragweed a little bit. It's not going to control it but it can actually slow it down a little bit. And then towards the front of this plot, there's a giant ragweed with some really good symptomology and maybe we'll have a picture of that to show what's going on with the command. It's that bleaching of the weeds and it's slowing down the giant ragweed's growth. Okay, our next set of treatments now, we're gonna focus on reflex and again, that's a PPO inhibitor from Syngenta that just got a 24C for Ohio for weed control and pumpkins. And before you use this product, I would really suggest that you read the 24C label because there can be a lot of injury associated with reflex on pumpkins and you assume all that risk on your own if you decide to use this product. There is some risk involved with using this product for injury and even more so on squash and definitely so on butternut squash according to the label. So they're almost saying do not use it on butternut squash and they recommend that you actually do a small trial of your own to make sure there's no injury before you decide to treat the variety that you have. It's in the PPO class of herbicides and here's some of the injury that we see when they come out like that. It's this leaf cupping and crinkling like we see on this really small leaf. And then these two show a little bit of that cupping also, but the plants typically outgrow that and you won't notice it later, but it does cause some injury at first. So you have to be willing to accept that type of injury. So I'm actually going to jump to plot number six here now, which is reflex at one pint. So that would be the highest rate that we could use. And the weed spectrum for reflex, again, is more of those small seeded broadleaves. And when I talk about small seeded broadleaves, I'm talking about weeds like the amaranthus, the pigweeds and the water hemp's, lamb's quarters, and other weeds that might have small seeds like that versus the larger seeded broadleaves, which would be like common and giant ragweeds, morning glories, velvet leaves that tend to have a larger seed. So again, this plot's very clean of the pig weeds, and if there was lamb's quarter out here, it'd probably be pretty clean of the lamb's quarter too. And then one thing with this product is it can have some activity on common and giant ragweed also. So this plot at the one pint rate is actually doing a pretty good job of controlling the ragweeds. But then, not that I want to fault it for anything, but it's not going to be as good 
controlling grasses. So we do see some small grasses coming up in this plot. And then once again, it's not gonna do a very good job with the morning glory. So we see a lot of morning glories again. So I kind of wanted to show what this treatment or the reflex would do at the full rate. And then we're gonna jump back and look at it at the half rate next. So we could just move right into that. So here's a half a pint of reflex, which is labeled, but on the label it says it's not to be intended to use be used by itself at that half pint rate. So when I look through here, I might be controlling all of the pigweeds. So that might be something that you would consider added, adding to like a duel or a strategy, but at this lower rate, now we can see a lot of velvet leaf coming in. There's actually would be more giant ragweed in here. Probably not going to pick up on the common ragweeds. And there should be more grass seedlings in here also, but um, for whatever reason, we're not seeing that. Okay, so now we're going to look at some mixes of reflex with some other products to try to get a broad spectrum weed control to try to pick up all the weeds out here and one of the first ones we're going to look at is the dual plus a pint of reflex and soybean growers actually have a product called prefix that is a premix that has those two products in it so it's pretty popular weed control and can do a pretty broad spectrum job of controlling weeds so you know I think as you, you look down this treatment you can see it's pretty clean the duels taking out all the grasses and now we have two modes of action working on the pigweeds so there's no pigweeds in this plot either we're not seeing any velvet leaf in here at that one pint of reflex rate it's gonna pick up all those velvet leaf and then I think there's not a lot of giant ragweed in this area towards this end of the plot, but there's a few little ones in here. It does seem to be slowing them down, and it does appear to be slowing down the morning glories just a little bit also. Number eight is a pint of reflex with sandia. So now we have two modes of action to control the broadleaf weeds and you know, like the label states, you can get a little bit of grass control out of the reflex, but not a whole lot. At the one pint rate that we saw in treatment six, we saw quite a bit of grass seedlings in there. Now this plot's really clean of the grass seedlings. It just could be because we're late in the season and it's just not coming up like it would in the spring. But we've pretty much controlled all the broadleaf weeds in here. Uh, we're still not controlling the morning glories perfectly they're always going to be hard to control but pretty clean of all the broadleaf weeds in here so our last treatment today is a pint of reflex with four pints of strategy and i would probably consider this our cadillac treatment for weed control and pumpkins um, we've got three different modes of action all working together to control the weed species in here so we're free of grasses, free of broad leaves, except for the morning glories. But, you know, with three modes of action, we've got a lot going on here. So um, we kind of use that term, the Cadillac program, because that's going to be the highest level of weed control that we're going to get. So um, this plot looks pretty clean, even though there is quite a bit of morning glory in here. They're just really hard to control. Okay, so a recap here, we went over some of the herbicides that are already available for pumpkins and the the new one with the 24c the the reflex and once again just a few things to point out on the reflex and maybe a couple of that i haven't gone over yet is to uh first of all please you know read the 24c label for reflex and then remember that you can have some injury with reflex on pumpkins you can have more of that injury on squash and especially to the butternut squash and then 
One thing that I didn't point out in the plots, but you need to be aware of, is that there are quite a few rotational restrictions that come with reflex or the active ingredient femesophen. Even in uh, to corn the next year, it's like 10 months, so there's a cutoff there for corn or sweet corn, and I know there are for some other products too, so it's pretty important to check out those rotational restrictions on reflex. One other point with the reflex that I didn't cover today is because this trial was established in late July. So the pumpkins came up really quick and didn't we didn't see a whole lot of injury. However, the label lets us know that in the spring when we have cool wet conditions the pumpkins struggle to come out of the ground anyway and come out a little bit slow so the reflex can compound that injury and we're more likely to see injury from reflex in the spring with cool wet soils and poor growing conditions thanks tony for that update on the herbicides and the weed screen even though some of those plots didn't look like they had much weed pressure, I guarantee you in the spring and summer of this year, we've had tremendous weed pressure over this entire research farm. We are now at stop number three, which is the powdery mildew fungicide trial. We've arrived here at the midway point in the pumpkin field day. We're going to talk about the powdery mildew fungicide trial and talk about managing powdery mildew in general. The first thing you need to know about managing powdery mildew is that it doesn't overwinter here in Ohio. It's just too cold for it. The spores blow up every year from the south and infect our crop typically around middle part of July or into the first part of August. During early to mid July it's really important to get out in your pumpkin or squash field and look for this disease because the threshold for treatment is really just when you find those very first couple of pustules on either the top or the bottom of the leaves. Typically, you'll see lesions show up on the bottom of the leaves first, but not always. So if you're doing your windshield survey, driving by your field at about 35 miles an hour, you're probably not going to catch it. But if you happen to stop and walk through the field, some edge locations, some center locations, then you're likely, as you flip over leaves and look at the leaves, be able to pick up the very first infestation of powdery mildew. Once you see that, that's going to be your signal to start treating on a 7 to 10 to 14 day schedule all the way through harvest to protect the foliage and protect the pumpkin handles from powdery mildew. As you begin to think about treating for this disease using fungicides, a couple of things are really important to know. There are actually a lot of products out there uh, that can control powdery mildew. Some of them are protectant sprays, which means they have to be on the plant prior to the uh, powdery mildew spores arriving to be effective. In the other class, those are more uh, systemic or translaminar, meaning you spray them on the plant, maybe the top of the plant, and they can either spread across the front of the leaf surface or actually go right through the leaf and protect the back of the leaf. That's the translaminar activity. No matter what product you choose to use to protect your crop against powdery mildew, there's one very important principle that you must follow. And that is, you need to alternate the FRAC numbers, which are the fungicide resistance action codes that are on the top of the label every time you spray. So if, for instance, the first time you spray, you use a product that has a FRAC code of three, the next time you spray, you do not want to use a FRAC code number three material. Anything but FRAC code three will work. For that third application, if you want, you can go back to that FRAC three uh, fungicide, and that's just fine. The only exception to this rule is if you're using M-class fungicides. Those are the general protectants like Bravo or Mancozeb. Those are products that you can use every spray to help generally protect the crop from different types of fruit rots or foliar diseases. There are also some things to be paying attention to that not every product can be alternated all the way through the season. Some of these fungicides have a limit of two sprays per season and then they're done. When scouting for powdery mildew, remember to look for a variety of leaves in terms of their age, new leaves and older leaves. So for instance, if I come over here and just pick one of these newer leaves and take a look at it on the top of the leaf surface and on the bottom of the leaf surface, I don't really see much. There's a little colony here and here and here, but I might conclude if I just look at the very newest foliage um, that there isn't much powdery mildew here. 
But if I take a little bit of a, a dive inside of here and get one of these older leaves, you can see there's quite a bit of powdery mildew on the top surface of the leaf, and you can see there's quite a few colonies developing on the back as well. So it matters where in the canopy you select these leaves. So get a good mixture of both older and newer leaves and take a look at both the top and bottom surface for powdery mildew. In the first leaf, you see the powdery mildew is barely detectable. It's at about a half or 1% infestation. In the second leaf, we're seeing more about four or 5% infestation. A little bit here in the front and some in that back corner there. And the third leaf, now we're talking about 30 to 40% infestation. If you start treating at this stage, you're going to be behind the game uh, the entire rest of the season. You really want to start to think about treating somewhere when the leaves look like this. And if your leaf foliage looks like that far one when you start treating, well, that leaf has 60 or 70% powdery mildew, and that leaf is likely going to die, not going to make it. So it's really important to start your fungicide program early, more when the leaves are in kind of this condition than when they're in that condition over there. I think we've gone over enough of the basics of how to scout for powdery mildew and how to treat using fungicides. Let's now turn our attention to the powdery mildew fungicide trial itself. This trial uh, was planted the first day of June. It's now uh, August 20th, so we've been in the ground uh, almost three months. Um, some details about the trial that are important. Uh, each one of these plants you see here, uh, the hybrid is all the same. It's a susceptible hybrid to powdery mildew because I really want to see what the effect of the fungicides are. So we use susceptible plants. Each row is about 80 feet long. There's about a 15 foot untreated check built into each one of these rows. These are demonstration, large plot demonstration. And what that means is that this work is not replicated. So we're taking multiple samples out of this long uh, 65 foot row of treated pumpkins. So some details about the powdery mildew fungicide trial that are important would be that from uh, this flag back to the beginning of the plot about 15 feet, this is not treated with any fungicide. So it serves as an untreated check. This tells us what's the baseline disease pressure at this point in time at this location. From the flag forward about 65 feet, that is all treated um, part of the plot with whatever fungicide program or combination we have chosen to use. So we're looking usually at one fungicide or product of interest rotated with another uh, compatible product uh, following all of the FRAC uh, guidelines, meaning we cannot repeat the FRAC numbers spray after spray. How we actually evaluate these plots is uh, years ago, I believe DuPont came up with this uh, percent uh, disease severity rating chart. And so you look on here, you'll be able to see that here's a half a percent with just a few pustules on the leaf. 1%, a few more, 2, 4, 6, 8, all the way down to about 80%. So you see at the 80% level, it looks like the whole leaf practically is covered, but there's still 20% area that's uh, exposed uh, that does not have powdery mildew colonies covering it. So we use this chart. We go ahead and pick out leaves in random locations from the treated section all the way up to the end of the plot. We'll look at a leaf that's right on the top uh, of the row at the top and the bottom of the leaf surface and then we'll look at a leaf that's a little bit lower in the canopy because again this leaf you might expect to get more fungicide because it's up but we're kind of curious to know what happens a little deeper in the canopy when we spray. In terms of how we make our applications here we shoot for about 65 uh, pounds per square inch pressure using hollow cone nozzles uh, at about 35 to 38 gallons per acre. So that's a pretty standard um, pressure and gallonage for us here at the station. If you have an option, you want to put on more liquid versus less liquid. There's so much surface area to cover here that by cutting back in the gallons per acre, you're going to reduce your efficacy because you simply can't get coverage to all these parts of the plant. And typically with most of the boom sprayers that we have, application to the top of the leaf surface is quite easy because the spray is coming down but it's really important to try to get that spray to penetrate down into the canopy because down in here is the proper microclimate that uh, powder mildew really likes and will take off. And once it gets started down here, it'll just transfer up onto these leaves here and you'll have kind of a, uh, a tough situation to manage. 
So my game plan to take you through these seven treatments would simply be to show you basically what the untreated check for that uh, treatment looks like compared to a section of the treated row for that particular uh, fungicide program. And I'll, maybe I'll make a few general comments about uh, the scouting we've done. Uh, we've gone ahead three times now and tried to figure out what's sort of the average above and below uh, powdery mildew pressure uh, in this treatment. I will tell you that typically we would see powdery mildew in the middle of July. However, this year we haven't seen, we didn't see powdery mildew until July 27th. And on July 28th, we made our first application. So after uh, today, we're going to have made our fourth application uh, to, this, to this trial. So roughly we're shooting for every seven to 10 days to make an application. So we're looking at treatment one right now. The main product of interest here is Luna Experience. This has the frat code of seven and three. There's actually two products that are in uh, Luna Experience. And so this is the untreated check here. And on average, we're seeing about 36% uh, infestation on the top of the leaves and about 33 in the bottom of the leaves. As we swing over past the yellow flag, we're moving into the treated area now. Uh, just went through this a couple hours ago. It looks like we're seeing um, about 2.5% infestation of powdery mildew on the top of the leaves and about 28% on the bottom of the leaves. So still better than the untreated check, um, but we are seeing um, some development of disease in this treatment. So here we're looking at treatment two. The main product of interest is Luna Sensation, also a Bayer product, has uh, two materials that make up this compound. We're swinging through the untreated check on the right there. Uh, you see a little bit of powder mildew on the top, but not very much. As you swing back left into the treated area, you see it looks pretty clean. You really can't see very much powdery mildew on the top surface of those leaves. When we went through today and evaluated the foliage, we really found 0% powdery mildew on the top of the leaf, but we found about 18% on the bottom of the leaf. And again, just a reminder, uh, prior in just the untreated checks, we saw about 36% on the upper leaf surface and about 33% on the lower leaf surface. So we're seeing about, um, about half of the amount of powdery mildew on the bottom in this particular treatment. What we're looking at now is treatment three. Uh, this is going to be a Procure by UPL. Here is the untreated check. You can see quite a bit of powdery mildew that's up on the top of the leaf surface and on the bottom leaf surface as well. As we swing by the flag going left, we're seeing that the leaf, uh, the top area of the leaf surface is cleaning up quite a bit and so is the bottom of the leaf surface. We're looking at about 0.2% infestation of powder mildew on the upper leaf surface and about 6.5% on the lower leaf surface. So quite a bit uh, cleaner than the untreated check. Here we're looking at treatment four, which is another combination of Procure with a um, Strobilurin product. We're seeing in the untreated check quite a bit of powder mildew show up on the upper surface of the leaf and also the bottom surface of the leaf. As we uh, swing by the yellow flag here in the middle and move to our left, we see that the upper leaf surface cleans up quite a bit and so does the lower leaf surface. In terms of the rating, this also got about a 0.2% infestation of powder mildew on the upper leaf surface and about a 3% infestation on the lower leaf surface. So again, quite a bit cleaner than the untreated check. Now we're looking at treatment number five, which is Miravis Prime. Uh, Miravis has two active ingredients. Uh, this is a, a product by Syngenta. As we swing through the untreated check, you see a lot of powdery mildew infestation on the upper leaf and lower leaf surface. We swing by the flag in the middle, getting into the treated area to the left of the flag, and we're seeing actually a pretty clean upper leaf surface and actually not too bad on the, on the lower leaf surface. Going through here earlier today, we noticed about 0.3% uh, percent powdery mildew infestation on the upper leaf surface and about 7% on the lower leaf surface. Uh, quite a bit cleaner than the untreated check. Now we're looking at treatment number six which is Inspire Super, also by Syngenta. Inspire Super has two active ingredients in it as well. As we swing through the untreated check, we see a lot of powdery mildew pressure on the upper and lower surface of these leaves. We're gonna swing by the yellow flag to get into the treated area. And what you should notice is that 
these uh, top uh, upper surface of the leaves are very clean and if you were to go in there and flip those leaves over you'd find that there's really not much powdery mildew on the underside as well. So earlier today went through here and looked at uh, and raided this plot. I uh, did not find any powdery mildew on the upper leaf surface and only found about four and a half percent on the lower leaf surface. So again this is quite a bit cleaner than the untreated check. The final treatment we're going to talk about today is Torino. That's a product from Gowan. Uh, we look here, we see the untreated check, quite a bit of powdery mildew on the uh, upper leaf surface and the lower leaf surface. We swing by the flag getting into the treated part of the plot and we see what looks like a pretty clean upper leaf surface and uh, actually a fairly uh, clean lower leaf surface as well. We uh, are looking at about 1.3% powder mildew infestation on the upper leaf surface and about 17% on the lower leaf. So not in that single digit category anymore, but still much, much cleaner compared to the untreated check. So that's a quick summary of all the treatments we have in this year's powdery mildew fungicide trial. I hope it gave you a little bit of insight and knowledge as to which one of these combinations seems to be working uh, better than the untreated check. And at this point, they all seem to be working pretty good. Um, just as a recap, all of these treatments are evaluated the same. I go ahead and select six random leaves and inspect the upper and lower leaf surface. I use this disease severity chart to figure out what percent that is, average the upper, average the lower values, and those are the numbers that we uh, present. This trial will be going on for another two to three weeks, but as you can see, a lot of the fruit that are in here are already mature. And so what that means is the plants are, have done their job and they're now they're beginning to naturally senesce and turn yellow. So we want to go ahead and get these last couple of uh, ratings taken before these plants completely uh, give up and decide to die for the season. Our fourth stop on this pumpkin field day is with Celeste Welty. She's going to talk about insect management and she's not here at the station. She's remote at Columbus. Take it away, Celeste. I'm Celeste Welty, an extension entomologist, and today we're going to be talking about pumpkin pests, primarily cucumber beetles, but a little bit about squash vine borer and about squash bug. Here's an example of beetle feeding on a leaf in late summer. Usually we're not concerned about leaf feeding by the beetles in late summer. It's very, very important in early summer, but it's sort of a clue that beetles are still active and you'd want to make sure and examine any fruit in the vicinity to make sure you're not starting to get some beetle feeding on the surface of the fruit. So we're in late summer now. We still have a few flowers in the pumpkin field and that is where the beetles are hanging out as well as that bumblebee that just flew in. So most growers get very good control of beetles in early summer by applying insecticide treated seed or a systemic product in furrow at planting time. The threshold we generally use for beetles, is, well those early treatments give good control till about the fourth leaf stage. After that we use a threshold if they're an average of three beetles per plant then it warrants a spray. But once we get into late summer and the flowers begin to uh, disappear then we're more concerned about pumpkin feeding on the surface of the fruit. So it's very important right as the, there are only a few flowers left to start looking at the surface of the fruit and what we're looking for is this kind of scarring. Usually it starts on the fruit handle and then it can move up onto the rind. This is still a pretty mild example but it can get uh, much more extensive and sometimes even gouge through the rind. So our tentative threshold we use uh, for this fruit scarring is when 20% of the plants show any scarring, we think it warrants a spray. But if the threshold is exceeded and an insecticide spray is needed, be sure to take care to spray at a time of day when the bees are not active, which is when the flowers are not open. And pumpkin flowers usually close up by noon on summer days, so afternoon or evening is a good time to spray. For cucumber beetle management, there are lures and traps available from two different companies that we decided to test out this year. So there are two different purposes for these traps and lures. One can be for monitoring the population so you know when they show up, when they reach a peak, when they fall off. The other could be for mass trapping as a control measure. So the standard type of trap involves some kind of yellow sticky surface. There are several different variations, but the kind of card we use uh, folds in two. So there's sticky yellow um, facing out in both directions. And then we tuck the lure just in between the two sticky surfaces. 
These are placed for monitoring about every 100 feet along the edge of a field, just above the canopy. Um, so one trap is supposed to more or less cover about 2,000 square feet. If we were using these for mass trapping purposes, we would need one trap for every 400 square feet, which is a much more intense use. So that's probably too intense for any commercial pumpkin growers, but for backyard pumpkin growers, you might want to give that a try for mass trapping. Then we compared this style, the same lure uh, in this style of trap, we compared with a homemade type of trap of a milk jug. So here we took a half gallon milk jug, we burned holes with a soldering iron to allow the beetles to enter, we suspended the lure just inside the cap, and then we used yellow duct tape around it because yellow is known to be very, very attractive to cucumber beetles. So we use this in a similar way to the sticky cards, placing it every 100 feet along the edge of a field. Our conclusions were that we got very, very few beetles going in the jug trap. We had more beetles going on the sticky trap. But in general, we didn't feel they really gave us a lot of new information that we couldn't tell by just simple scouting of the plants. Um, but one way they might be useful is if you're a scout that can only visit a pumpkin field once a week, and that once a week might be during a time when the weather is not conducive to beetle activity, like it's raining or very windy, then the trap could tell you what has occurred over the past week. So in, in some pumpkin fields in mid and late summer, you can see a whole plant begin to wilt and die, as we see here. So one thing, you can look at the general pattern of the color change. In this case, I see a range. Some leaves are still more green, some are a little bit yellow, some are a lot yellow, and some are all the way crispy and brown. All of that is consistent with squash vine borer, which slowly kills the plant. So to make sure it's squash vine borer, a good first step is to examine the base of the plant and look for any holes with sawdust-like grass coming out of them. And here is the base of this plant. I do see some holes and frass right here and also down here. And chances are there's some on the, the underside of the stem. The holes can be very easy to see when they're on this upper side. They can be quite difficult to see if they're on that underside. So I think that is pretty conclusive proof that there's a borer, although if you want to be absolutely sure, you can cut open the stem and see if the borer is inside. But if you do not find a hole and you do not find frass, then it could be yellow vine decline. That is characterized by the leaves being a much more a sudden uniform yellow. That is a disease that affects the vascular tissue of the plant. And if it were bacterial wilt, again, you would see no hole, no frass, but the leaves, instead of drooping downwards, they tend to do more of a cupping upwards. And bacterial wilt is not as common on pumpkins as it is on other kinds of soil pest that sometimes is a problem in pumpkins is the squash bug. Most of the time there are only a few squash bugs around in a pumpkin field so they're not a big deal but occasionally they can build up to high numbers. The most common place that squash bugs lay their eggs is on the underside of leaves. They're brown and shiny, very very hard. If you try and squish them you have to press very hard in order to, to kill those eggs. What we have here on this leaf is a cluster of squash bug nymphs. If you can zoom in, you see the damage they cause. They suck the sap out of the leaves. So initially it's yellow patches and then those patches turn brown. At the moment on this leaf, we don't have any adult squash bugs, but we have some of the immatures that are a light gray color. The adults are a dark brown and, and quite a bit larger. But that is very typical squash bug feeding on the leaf. Here's an example of the adult squash bug. It's dark brown, very hard bodied. They really prefer to feed on stems, but they do sometimes feed on leaves. If you bother them by sort of giving them a little bit of a squeeze, they emit an odor that's like banana extract, artificial banana extract. This particular squash bug adult is doomed for death. And I can tell because they're in about the middle of the body on the underside. Those are two eggs. Those are elliptical white eggs. 
and those are the eggs of a parasitoid fly that is working inside the body of this squash bug and will soon be killing it. There are several natural enemies of pumpkin pests, as shown in this box of dead specimens. Along the top of the box are three of the pests. We have the spotted cucumber beetle, the striped cucumber beetle, and the squash bug. Along the middle of the box is the pupil stage of the natural enemy that can be found killing each of these pests. Killing the spotted beetle, the striped beetle, and the squash bug. And then along the bottom is the adult stage of these natural enemies. The uh, Celatoria diabroticae that attacks the spotted cucumber beetle, the Celatoria setosa that attacks the striped cucumber beetle, and this feather-legged fly called Trichopoda penipes that attacks the squash bug. So the way it works with these natural enemies, all three of these are parasitoid flies that kill the pests from the inside out. So the way it works, this adult fly lays an egg on the outside of the pest, usually the adult, and then that egg hatches into a tiny maggot that burrows into the pest. And then that maggot develops inside the pest until it's fully grown. Then it pushes out of the body of the pest and forms a puparium around itself. So that's what we find uh, usually on the soil underneath the pumpkin plant. So this puparium exists for about a week. Then a new adult fly emerges from it, which we see in the bottom row. So most pumpkin fields have some of these parasitoids. But our surveys have shown that they're present in an average of about 13% of the beetles. We haven't quantified the parasitism in the squash bug, but in the past two weeks, my helpers have collected a large number of squash bugs to start a lab colony, and every day we're finding some of the puparia in our colony. So we think we have a lot of parasitism going on right now in our local population. So one reason for spraying insecticides only when necessary is to avoid killing these beneficial natural enemies. Thanks, Les, for sharing that information. Great as always. I especially liked how you ended the segment with the trichopoda fly parasitizes and murders the squash bug. That's always a great story. Speaking about things that are about to end, for those of you who don't know, Celeste is going to be retiring in November after a 30 plus career here at Ohio State, where she serviced not only vegetable growers, but small fruit and tree fruit growers as well, with both her research and extension programs. She will be missed. However, in recognition of all the great things she's done for the growers in the state, especially the pumpkin growers, she has been awarded the highly coveted and only awarded three prior times the Golden Pumpkin Award. This is a recognition of excellence in her programming for 30 plus years. This award is equivalent to the Oscars, the Tonys, or the Emmys. Very prestigious. Celeste, on behalf of myself and all the growers in the state, we want to thank you for your 30 plus career service and wish you the best in retirement. Our fifth and final stop on the Pumpkin Field Day Tour today is right here in the Pumpkin and Squash Hybrid Trial. Whether you like your pumpkin small and exotic like this, or the larger, more traditional jack-o'-lantern, or everything in between, you've come to the right spot to look at our squash and pumpkin hybrid demonstration trial here at the Western Ag Research Station in 2020. Behind me, you can see this year's pumpkin and squash hybrid trial. There are 28 hybrids here in 27 plots, and a good question would be, what is the purpose of the trial? It is a purpose to show you and demonstrate to you the different sizes and shapes and colors of pumpkins and squash that are out there, but there's also a little deeper meaning. We're trying to convey certain IPM principles, in particular those of, de of disease management, which would talk about using powdery mildew tolerant and powdery mildew resistant varieties if you can find the type of pumpkin or squash that you want to grow. By using those types of pumpkins, you will actually help manage your disease pressure for powdery mildew uh, better in your fields and have better looking and healthier plants, possibly leading to uh, more fruit or healthier fruit. I do want to mention that even though these hybrids can be tolerant or resistant to powdery mildew, you still need to use fungicides to keep that disease at a manageable level. The 28 hybrids we have here are composed of commercially available hybrids and a few experimentals. Let's talk about the basic production practices that went into this trial. Each plot is 50 feet long. The hybrids were all direct seeded, three to four feet within the row. The rows are 15 feet apart. So each plant has between 45 and 60 square feet, which in some cases is a lot more than the plant needs, and in other cases it's just about the right amount for those larger hybrids. 
For weed control, we use Strategy Pre-Emergent. That's our standard package here at the research station. After we applied the herbicide, we didn't receive any rain for seven to 10 days, which means that herbicide did not have a chance to activate. And as a result, we had a lot of weed escapes here in this plot to deal with by either hoeing or by pulling. In terms of the plot harvest day that we're gonna talk about, just realize we're looking at a single plot. These are not replicated plots. And so we're gonna talk about the average weight based on three or four harvested fruit, which appear to be average in size. There will be maybe some a little bit smaller, maybe some a little bit larger, but on average, that weight should be pretty good. We're going to give you the mature fruit as of today, which is mid-August, but Again, these fruit um, were stressed a little bit from the 90 degree weather we had in July. And so we're seeing a lot of late set fruit that will come on later on about a month or so and make even more mature fruit. So the numbers that I give you are gonna be on the low side. If you wanna take the number of fruit we have per plot and try to figure out what that would be on a per acre basis, you can multiply the number of fruit I talk about by 58 and that will give you the number of fruit based on these dimensions uh, of what you can expect per acre. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and take the tour. In front of me is the hybrid snowball. It's from Seeger Seed. It's a powder mildew tolerant variety. It's got about 100 day, days to maturity rating. Um, we went through here and the range of fruit that I weighed was between 1.9 and 2.9 pounds per fruit, average weight, is about two and a half pounds per fruit. Uh, what's interesting here is that this vine, this foliage is tremendously large for a pumpkin that's this small. Um, in here, from what I could tell, was about 50 mature fruit, but that gets added to basically every day. This large orange jack lantern pumpkin is called 20 karat gold. It's by Rupp Seeds. It's a powder mildew tolerant variety. It's about a 100 day to maturity hybrid as well. We harvested in here several fruit and they ranged in weight from 17.2 pounds to about 18.3 pounds with an average of 17.7 .7 pounds per fruit. Uh, in this 45 or 50 foot stretch of row, we picked out 16 mature fruit. Here we have half pint. This is a seed for a hybrid from Seegers. It's a powder mildew tolerant. It's an 80 days to maturity uh, hybrid. We harvested this a couple days ago. It ranged from 1.1 to 1.4 pounds per fruit, which is an average of about 1.2, 1.3. We harvested 45 fruit in this row. And one thing I'll mention is this is a shorter row. We lost a few plants on the end, so that 45 is an underestimate of what these will produce. Next on our list is Bay Horse Gold. This is by Rupp Seeds. This has a 100 day to maturity um, rating. These are fairly large fruit. We harvested in here. Our average was between 15 pounds per fruit and 20.7 20 pounds per fruit for an average of 18.1. When I went through this 50 foot plot, I found 15 pumpkins that are mature. This is Orange Sunrise from Harris Seeds. It's a 100 days to maturity hybrid. Uh, it's a powder mildew tolerant hybrid. We harvested in here uh, a few days ago and we picked a few fruit from 11.5 pounds to 14.7 pounds a piece. Average weight about 13.5 13 pounds per fruit. And up and down this 50 foot chunk, we found 16 marketable fruit. In front of me here is Ritz Hybrid. It's from uh, Seeger Seed. It's about 100 days to maturity. Don't really know if it's got any powdery mildew tolerance or not. It's not listed in the catalog. We went ahead and harvested this. It's between 11.7 and 15.4 pounds per fruit, averaging about 13.9. Going through this plot, we found 11 mature fruit at this point. This is our James Bond pumpkin in the patch. This is Spectre. This is from Harris Seeds. It has uh, 95 days to maturity. It's powdery mildew tolerant. We harvest these onto here between 8.3 pounds and 13.4 pounds a couple days ago. Uh, average is about 11 and a half pounds per fruit. And we found 14 mature fruit in this 50 foot stretch. Uh, we might expect a few more. Here we have Fall Splendor Plus. This is a small pumpkin from Cicada Seeds. It's a powder mildew tolerant, 105 days to maturity hybrid. Uh, we harvested this a few days ago and we ranged between 3.1 pounds per fruit and 4.4 pounds per fruit, uh, averaging 3.7 pounds per fruit. In this 50 foot of row, we have at this point 20 mature fruit. 
This little fruit is called Rockefeller. It's from Seeger Seed. It's a powder mildew tolerant variety. It's a 95 days to maturity uh, hybrid as well. We harvested these fruit a few days ago, 1.9 pounds to 2.1 pounds average. So very consistent two point average, two pound average. And there's about 45 of these fruit up and down this 50 foot row. This is Charisma. This is our first entry from Johnny's. This is a powder mildew tolerant hybrid, 98 days to maturity. We harvested in here and um, they range from 8.5 pounds per fruit to about 12.6 pounds per fruit, an average of about 10 pounds per fruit. Uh, there's about eight fruit up and down this plot that are mature at this point. This is our first experimental hybrid. This is RUP RPX 6229. And you can see it's kind of a tannish fruit. Uh, it's a powder mildew tolerant hybrid. Um, it's got about a 90 day maturity. When we went through and harvested here, we found fruit between 7.5 pounds and 8.7 pounds a piece. Average about 8.1 pounds. And about 15 mature fruit throughout this plot. This is the second offering from Rupp Seeds for an experimental. This is RPX 6875. It is a uh, 90 uh, day to maturity hybrid. It does not have any powdery mildew tolerance built into it. We harvested here average fruit size between 4.2 and 5 pounds a piece. So that makes the average weight about 4.6 pounds a piece. Um, and we found um, 14 of these fruit up and down this 50 foot stretch of row. This little guy here is Bisbee Gold. This is an offering from Rupp Seeds. It's a 90 day to maturity hybrid. So it's a short season hybrid. It's powdery mildew tolerant. We harvested in here fruit that were between 3.3 and 5.7 pounds, average of about 4.6. We pulled out about 22 fruit within this section of row right here. Here we have two very similar pumpkins. This is Blue Doll, and it's got its companion, the yellow one, which is Indian Doll. There's actually a third doll, it's called Porcelain Doll, but we don't have it in the trial this year. So for the Blue Dolls, these are from Harris. These are 100 days to maturity. Uh, these have powdery mildew tolerance. Uh, we weighed a couple of these and we got between 11.9 and 21.3 pounds. So quite a spread. You can see the difference in the size up front there. Um, average weight of about 16.6 um, pounds per fruit. And again, we have half of this row is one variety. So we harvested seven mature fruit, which means in a full 50 feet, you'd probably get about 14 or 15 fruit. Likewise, we'll change gears and go to the Indian doll. This is the more yellow, the more golden of the two, a little bit flatter uh, in most respects. Again, powdery mildew tolerant, 100 day to maturity hybrid. We harvested these a bit smaller than the uh, blue doll, about 7.7 .7 to 18 pounds a piece, averaging about 12.9. Uh, Again, we found about seven mature fruit in the row, but it's only half a row. So really we're talking a 14 or 15 per 50 foot section of row. Okay, moving on. This is a nice white pumpkin from Heresy. This is called Crystal Star. It's a 100 days to maturity hybrid. Uh, does not have any reported powder mildew tolerance or resistance. Uh, we harvested out of here fruit that were between 9.9 .9 pounds and 12.9 pounds, giving, giving us a good average of about 11 pounds per fruit. Um, and there's 16 of these nice white fruit up and down this 50 foot stretch of row. This little pumpkin right here is Annabelle. This is from Seeger's Seed. It's about a 95 day uh, hybrid. It is uh, got powdery mildew tolerance. We weighed fruit out of here 1.7 to 2 pounds a piece. So averaging about 1.9 pounds. Uh, up and down this row here, we found about um, an amazing 44 fruit. So a very productive plant in this 50 foot stretch of row. This is Silver Edged. It's a hybrid from Harris Seeds. It's a 95 day to maturity hybrid. Uh, there's no information about its powdery mildew tolerance. We harvest fruit in here, which were mostly small, between 3.4 and 6.1 pounds a piece, averaging about 4.7 pounds. Now, even though this is a reduced row, we lost some plants early on. We only have about six mature fruit that are in here right now. Uh, more are sizing right now, but as of today, only six mature fruit. This interesting golden bumpy looking fruit is called Sanchez. It's an offering from Harris Seeds. It's a 95 day to maturity hybrid. It doesn't have any powdery mildew tolerance reported, but it, the foliage is holding up pretty well, I think. 
We went ahead and took some weights out of here, 3.4 pounds per fruit on the small side, five pounds on the large side, averaging about four and a half pounds of fruit. Uh, up and down through this row, we found 26 mature fruit to date. From this point forward in the trial, everything was harvested about a week later than the first 18 hybrids I showed you. You might see some that are a little bit green or have some green striping in them. This means they have just a little bit more to go in terms of turning orange, but they are mature. So this little guy right here, this is Gumdrop. This is some Johnny Seed. It's about 100 days to maturity hybrid. Uh, I don't have any information about the powdery mildew tolerance of this. When we harvest in here, we pulled fruit out that were from 9.9 .9 to 10.6 pounds. Uh, that makes an average of 10.3 pounds per fruit and we harvested 10 fruit in this plot. This hybrid here is Tom Fox. This is also a hybrid from Johnny Seeds. Uh, there is no information available about its powder mildew tolerance. It's about a 100 day to maturity hybrid. When we harvested in this plot, we uh, pulled out fruit between 13.3 pounds a piece and 23.3 pounds a piece for an average of 17.4 pounds per fruit. And we found nine mature fruit up and down this 50 foot stretch of row. This is Zeus. It's an offering from Harris Seeds. It's a 100 days to maturity hybrid. It does have powder mildew tolerance. We harvested in here a couple days ago and found fruit anywhere from 13.9 to 17.1 pounds with an average of 15.4 pounds a piece. Up and down this row, we have 15 mature fruit. This medium sized pumpkin right here, this is Hermes. Hermes is also from Harris Seed. It's about a 90 to 95 day to maturity hybrid. It does have powdery mildew tolerance. We harvested in here fruit that were 10 pounds to 13.1 pounds a piece for an average of 12 pounds. We found 12 mature fruit in this 50 foot stretch of row. This is Secretariat from Harris Seeds. It's a 105 day to maturity hybrid. It does have powdery mildew tolerance. We came in here, we harvested, we found fruit that ranged between 12.2 and 15.3 pounds for an average of 13.5 pounds per fruit. Up and down this row, we found 13 mature fruit. So this is the hybrid carry. It's an offering from Seeger Seed. It's a 100 day to maturity hybrid. It does have powder mildew tolerance. We harvested fruit in here about a week ago and saw weights range from 10 pounds a piece to 13.9 pounds a piece with an average of 12.5 pounds per fruit. We found 14 mature fruit up and down this 50 foot stretch of row. So this is Red Witch and I know what you're thinking. It's not all that red and it's not all that scary. But the reason that it's sort of in this yellow state is because we received seed about three weeks later than all the other hybrids. So this is about three weeks behind. When this matures, it should look more orangey, orangey red. This is an offering by Seeger Seeds. It's a 95 day to maturity hybrid. Um, it does not have any reported powdery mildew tolerance. And then this 50 foot plot, we went ahead and uh, harvested fruit between 6.3 pounds a piece and 9.6 pounds. Again, those fruit are not mature. They're immature, they're still sizing, so they'll be even bigger. Uh, the average here is about 7.6 right now. And we were able to find up to 23 fruit in this 50 foot stretch of row as of now. This is the third and final experimental entry from Rupp Hybrids. This is RPX 6208. It's a powder mildew tolerant pumpkin. It's about 100 days to maturity pumpkin as well. We went in here and harvested several fruits and they weigh between 12.1 and 20.5 pounds a piece with an average of 16.2. Up and down through this section of row, we found 16 mature fruits so far. This is the 28th and final hybrid in the trial. This is Thor. This is from Seeger Seeds. This is a 105 days to maturity hybrid. I did not see any powder mildew tolerance listed for it. We harvested several fruit in this row. Uh, they averaged um, between 14.6 pounds and 17.2 pounds a piece for a 15.7 pound average. And up and down this row, we found 16 fruit. So that's it. That's all 28 hybrids in the trial. Hopefully you see there's a lot of variety in fruit that has powder mildew tolerance and maybe you found a couple that you might want to try in 2021. We'll be coming out with a 3D field scale model of this trial, which will allow you to walk around each of these plots individually, look at the fruit and look at the information that we've discussed already, the hybrid name, the seed company, days to maturity, etc. So look for that coming out shortly. Well, that's it. 
the 2020 virtual pumpkin field day is over. I hope that you learned a few things about managing insects, weeds, and diseases today that you can take home and use on your farm yet this season or in many years to come. As always, we'd like to end our field days here at the research station with a nice wagon ride back to the main headquarter building. Thank you for attending. Hope to see you live and in person next year. Eileen, Eileen, how I love Eileen. Here at Larry's Leaning Pumpkins, we pride ourselves on our patented leaning pumpkins. Each and every fruit is crooked with care and lopsided with love through the elimination of all flying insects from our property. Since 2006, when we let Kids Bop 10 film a music video here and every child was stung by a yellow jacket on their juice break and every one of them was allergic, we've been committed to a safe pumpkin picking environment for our customers. We've got murder hornets covered. At Larry's Leaning Pumpkins, you'll find a limited selection of these highly coveted pumpkins. Why demand perfection when you can have Eileen?